Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here moderating the first debate of this uh, excellent conference. And we've got some great participants today. So we've got Mark Huerta's company, uh, Francois Anous, Anastas, sorry, I can't pronounce the last name, uh, and Laurence uh, Parole Levasseur, who is online and we'll see somewhere around. Um, so this. <laughs> It's big C. Um, so this first debate is going to be on what flavors of machine learning techniques are appropriate for astronomy. So I'm very excited to hear what everyone's opinions are and what everyone's thoughts are. If you've got any questions, then um, we'll save it until after the small talk that everyone's going to give just to, as an introduction to, the, to the, the topic. And then you can put your hands up and we'll come and talk around. Or if you're... Uh, online, then if you just send a message in the Slack, we'll uh, try and get round and make some interesting debate and discussion around everything. So, Mark, would you like to uh, start us off? Okay. Um, I th so how yeah, I think, yeah. 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 yeah, so if you just press this button. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's see how this experience experiment works. Um, so, the idea today, I think, is so to debate our topic. Yeah, so our topic is uh, what flavors of machine learning techniques are most appropriate for astronomy. Um, and so what I have in mind, uh, let me see if this works. Okay, so I'll try to be a bit um, on the provocative side today. Um, and so, because this is intended to be a debate and see if we can, you know, have some uh, lively discussion. Um, so I think that uh, probably before wondering about um, what flavor should I use, um, I think the question is, uh, do I need to use machine learning for um, my project? It doesn't work? Okay. <laughs> like this? <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Is that good now? Good. Okay. <laughs> And, and so the question I wanted to address before my colleagues, you know, take over is um, should I use machine learning and how when I'm facing an astrophysical problem, uh, how do I decide if I actually want to go to machine learning? Um, because, you know, at least for, uh, it's the first time I feel old in a, in a conference, by the way. And so in a, in a, when, when I come, have students coming to my office sometimes and I have this uh, many times this uh, remarks saying, I want to do a machine learning project, whatever astrophysics is, right? And, um, and I think we should think the other way around. Um, and so, let's see if this thing moves. And so my, my two cents for this debate is I think that uh, machine learning at the end has become very uh, powerful, uh, but if you think about it, the, me the real success is we are able to classify cat and cats and dogs and images very efficiently and very fast. Uh, better than humans, probably, but this is what we can do with machine learning, and this is most of the what industry is doing uh, at different levels of complexity. But this is what the um, AI uh, uh, modules that are used in, in in industry are mostly doing. And so, uh, if you are faced to a science problem, my my advice or my 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 uh, two cents here for this for this debate would be that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> The <laughs> Definitely. So the farther is your science case from this, you know, basic cats and dog classification, the less or the less likely it is that you can use an out of the box machine learning solution to your problem. And the more you need to think or how to adapt your machine learning solution or if, whether you need to use it and how to adapt it to the uh, scientific problem you want to face. And, um, and so I, I want to raise here precisely uh, just to emphasize this, the favorite question of my colleague uh, Brice, who is uh, out there, uh, who uh, uh, says, what, what, uh, what, have we learned something uh, really new on astrophysics since we have been applying deep learning in that particular case uh, since basically 2015? So it's now six years we've been applying deep learning. And, and I, I, will, I will argue that um, beyond the fact, again, that we can classify efficiently objects, uh, stars, galaxies, uh, uh, different types of objects in images, perhaps detect them as well quite efficiently as we've seen today. Uh, I don't know if we have 
really uh, learn something new. And, and it's not because you know, we are not trying hard. This is a nice plot also produced by uh, Brees and, and colleagues in which you can see the amount of uh, papers that quote neural network in the abstract. Uh, this is only in astrophysics as compared to other fields. You know? And in terms of production, it's much more than any other field uh, in, and in the growth, in the relative growth. Uh, however, what are the new uh, results that we can quote? Uh, maybe there are many, but my, my, my uh, first impression is that, you know, uh, it's basically most of the key papers are about still on classification. Okay, and so I want to introduce the cat and dog ruler, essentially, which is uh, telling uh, basically when you are faced to a uh, astrophysical problem, how do you want to decide um, uh, what machine learning flavor do you want to use and whether you want to use machine learning. And essentially, uh, again, so uh, it's essentially uh, when you have a classification problem, of course, uh, would you want to, uh, will you use you know, machine learning to classify galaxy morphologies? If I ask this question to the audience, I think probably now uh, close to 100% of you would say yes. This is the solution to classify galaxy morphology. Uh, to classify galaxy morphologies, this is exactly a cat and dog classification problem. Uh, there are spatial correlations, so you want to use uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, in that particular case, uh, interpretability is not really an issue, so you don't care that it's a black box. You just want to put galaxies in boxes, or or and 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 then use it. Uh, and uncertainty really is not a big problem. Uh, because, you know, even visual classifications will be quite uncertain. So you don't really need a, a precise uh, certainty quantification. Now, for example, uh, you can go a bit further and say, would you use, you know, machine learning to classify strong lenses? And I think the answer, again, as we have seen today, uh, would be probably yes. Uh, it's slightly uh, more difficult because now you need uh, a more risky uh, point is that you need to train on simulations. You don't have training sets. And now you start already, you know, hitting a regime in which you need some extrapolation and you might ask, already start asking uh, some questions about that. Uh, next step, uh, do you want to uh, use machine learning to get, detect galaxies? And we've seen already talks about these. But then, of course, machine learning flavor that you would like to use, it's probably, again, convolutional neural networks. It's a very similar problem. Uh, we have detected objects. Uh, we have many. Uh, out-of-the-box tools now from industry to detect objects, uh, and we have seen some examples. However, when you start doing science from these, then you start having some pro problems that you don't find in industry, and you need to start, you know, maybe adapting your model and asking more questions like the noise properties, how do you define an object? This is not trivial in our field. Uh, you have no boundaries, no edges. Uh, so maybe, you know, an out-of-the-box model doesn't work uh, at this point already. Uh, how do you find Outliers. This is a big question in which machine learning is very promising. Uh, uh, and there are several papers, including myself, working on these. Uh, so basically, finding outliers is uh, you are trying to find data that differ from the from the overall distribution. Uh, you m probably want to go to unsupervised learning to do this because precisely you are looking for something that is out uh, of the distribution. But again, it's similar to a classification problem. You want to find a specific class of objects, but you don't know what object you're finding. Uh, but then you have questions like what distribution you want to, uh, what, what distribution is, uh, describes your data, what metric, probably the outlier definition depends on the science problem. And so you need to start, it's, it's not, yeah, I'm almost done, thank you. It's not a problem of, you know, uh, just taking, you can go to scikit-learn, grab all the possibilities of to find outliers, but probably won't work for your, for your science case. And you can continue with this in your cat and dog ruler. Of course, you can go to photometric redshift, which is also very, uh, uh, has a, attracted lots of, of uh, interest in the community. And, and it's, I think it's a nice case in which, uh, as we have seen today, uh, lots of people have tried, but at the end, state of the art is still template, uh, template fitting. And, uh, and, and there, we must ask ourselves why. And I think here my colleagues have some, some explanations for that. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can go even further. Can you accelerate simulations? We've seen many, uh, uh, you enter in the generative uh, modeling realm, uh, how to you know, accelerate uh, uh, simulations. But this has to go, of course, beyond uh, uh, simulating pretty images of, of people. Uh, you, know? you need to uh, make sure that your data fulfills some uh, criteria, and again, you know, using out-of-the-box uh, things might be risky for these uh, kind of, of approaches. 
And I will end up with the last point, of course, uh, which I don't have an answer to, but would you trust here machine learning to rule out Lambda CDM at some point? Maybe, I don't know. I will leave that question open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so now we're going to hear some thoughts from Francois. Um, yes, I think, yeah. yeah, you can pass the controller over, and you've got a microphone now. Yeah, so can you, can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Awesome. Great. Right, Thank thanks, you. Mark. This is actually pretty much in alignment with what, what I'm going to say, so not much conflict here. Um, so I thought I would start these slides by um, thinking about what the question we were asked about. And when I thought about this question, where can you apply machine learning, the opposite question is actually maybe more interesting. Where would you not apply machine learning and start from there? Um, so that's where I started thinking about. And then um, I went back to why we're actually having this discussion today. So why are we all here today? So it, we're, we talked about machine learning, but the real reason why we are all here today is because of deep learning. And something really special happened um, around 2015. And so I'm taking this example of strong lens finding because I think it's, it's a perfect example of, of what exactly happened. So before 2015, we, you know, we are doing astronomy, we're uh, working on high dimensional data, images and stuff like that. Um, and so when you wanted to do some smart task uh, on such kind of data, you had to use your own physical uh, interpretation of the data, your own physical knowledge to come up with some very clever way of solving a task. So this example that I have here is called Ring Finder um, by Rafael Gavazzi, who's maybe somewhere around here, um, where the way that he's finding arcs around uh, central lenses is by subtracting the light from the central object using his astrophysical knowledge that the central object should have a different color um, compared to the background object. And so by doing that, um, is that going to work? Yeah, so by doing that, he's able to uh, identify regions in the image uh, which seem to be outlier and which may be uh, artifact, I mean, sorry, uh, strong lenses events, for instance, here. So in this approach, you have to think really hard about the problem you're trying to solve and then use a lot of your uh, built-in knowledge. And it's very difficult and it doesn't work very well because you cannot think about all of the possible situations that may arise. And then after 2016, uh, that's where the deep learning methodology came uh, to solve these kind of things. And so what changed is that is a completely different ways of addressing the problem. Instead of putting your expertise in how do I solve the problem directly, you put your expertise in how do I build a framework that will allow me to find automatically the solution to my problem. And this is exactly what you have here. So the framework, you have uh, some training data, it will play a role. You have some neural network architecture, uh, which is essentially just a parametric function. And then you have a loss function uh, that allows you to find the solution of your problem. Um, and so the key realization here is that you're reframing the way that you're thinking about problem by just coming up with a framework that allows you to solve it. Uh, and that's where your expertise now goes instead of directly at the level of in understanding the pixel level data yourself. All right, so, so now, uh, since it's all a matter of framing a question and having a framework that will allow you to find the solution to that question, uh, let's, let's think a, a little bit about what a neural network does uh, you know, out of the box when you apply it. So in many cases, uh, most cases of regression, all cases of classification, what happens when you train a neural network is that you're actually doing Bayesian inference, even if you don't realize it. So the Bayesian inference that happens is one, approximate, so it's not perfect, uh, and two, it's amortized, which means it, it does a one-pass inference uh, on your problem. And so how, does it, how, would, how is this Bayesian uh, inference problem is stated? Well, simply in terms of what you choose for your loss function, which will define essentially what distribution, uh, posterior distribution or summary of a posterior distribution you're looking for, and your, your prior, which comes in at the level of your training set. So once you've chosen your training set, your architecture, and your loss function, you are solving some sort of Bayesian uh, inference problem. And then if we have a Bayesian understanding of what's going on, the question is, OK, but what can go wrong then? Uh, because we all love Bayes here. Uh, so several things can go, go wrong. It's always, always, always happens. But the very first one, which is maybe the most important one, is that your neural network, if it's optimal, it will do the task that you ask of it. 
but it's never the case. Uh, no matter how good you are at training on your own network, it will, uh, your optimized network will be somewhere between complete garbage and perfect, perfect, perfectly doing the tasks. And you never know exactly where you are. So you should never trust really your, you know, your neural network at face value and always keep in mind that it's only an approximation to the task that you want to do. And so getting closer to the optimum is not really uh, astrophysics research here. It's research for machine learning people that will come up with better neural networks, uh, better ways of training them and this type of things. So where do we come in? Um, where we actually come in in this process is when we ask the question, and that's where we need to put in our astrophysical knowledge. So, um, for instance, the, the question that we have here is when I train my when I build my training data, I should be very careful about any selection effect that come inside my training data and this type of stuff. And the most common issue that you can find pretty much everywhere is what's called covariate shifts. Uh, which means that the assumption that you've made for training the network, essentially your prior, is not going to match what happens in real data. So, you know, the target problem. And because you have this mismatch, you can make mistakes and you can get the wrong answer on your particular problem. So is that, is that use always a problem? Um, in many cases it is. In, in some cases it's not that bad. Um, so on a concrete example, here you have an example that, you know, you, Tell me this is too simple, but it actually illustrates pretty well the point. You have a few data points. You are fitting this green function here. Um, and the actual function is this red one for which you don't really have the training data. And so when I show you this image, you're like, of course, yeah, you shouldn't do that. But in practice, that's what we do all the time. We are training on some blue data points. And if we're not extremely careful about how we build this training set, then the function that we are optimized may not be and will not be optimal for the target problem. So, okay, um, can I show you an example of that? Yep. Um, so here, I, I, I really like this paper, but I don't get me wrong, but, but uh, it's a good example, a good illustration for the problem. So this is a problem, this is a, a paper where they try to solve the deblending problem, where you have two galaxies that overlap on the sky. And they try to solve it with a black box neural network. So it takes as an input the, the postage stamp and outputs two images directly. So doing a one pass inference stuff. Um, and so they train it on simulation and stuff like that. And then what happens when you train a model like this is that you do a bunch of things implicitly and you have to be very aware of what happens. So the likelihood in this problem would be, for instance, uh, the amount of noise that you have in your, in your image, the, the PSF size that you have for a particular image and this type of thing is embedded in the network at the level of your training set. And once it's trained, it's not, you cannot touch it anymore. It's too bad because uh, the likelihood function is usually something we understand for this type of problem. Then the prior on galaxy morphology is also built in inside and you cannot dig it out from, from the model. And on top of all of that, you're asking the network to solve the inference problem in just one pass. And so you're just asking a lot of stuff from this little network. And so what happens in practice is that you train your network, you apply it, um, and so I'll just show you an, ex an example of failure, if I can. So you have this yellowish point here, uh, which comes up at the, at the end of the, of the model, uh, but this is not contained in the data. There is no incentive in the data for having actually some signal there. So this is an example of failure, which you know, should, like if you do a correct approach, should not happen, where you have injected additional signal where you do not have any signal. And so that is a complete violation of flux preservation and stuff like that. And then we can ask ourselves, um, like, when is this dangerous to use neural network in these cases? And I'll just keep that. We can keep that for follow-up questions. So for instance, for uh, strong lens finding, as Fred mentioned, or for uh, trying to infer the photometric redshift uh, directly from images. I'll let you think about that and you can ask me questions afterwards. Uh, all right, so how do we uh, limit the reach of this black box so that we can still understand what's going on? So here, I would argue that you want to use a physical model wherever you, where, wherever you can, uh, and you want to do your analysis always in a Bayesian context, and that is what will give you uncertainty quantification, strong uncertainty quantification. You can ask me about Bayesian neural networks afterwards. Um, and so where do we need deep learning in this context? Well, only for the things that you wouldn't never be able to model otherwise. 
Um, and so that that's, brings me to my favorite flavor of machine learning, and which I think also is the most useful tool that came out of this whole resolution, uh, revolution for us. It's called generative modeling. And essentially, what it comes down to is the ability to model a distribution from just having access to sample from that distribution. So you can use it to uh, you know, learn pretty faces, as Mark said. Uh, but you can embed this, this thing in a completely you know, well-constructed and robust Bayesian framework for doing a huge amount of things. So for instance here, uh, it's a paper with Niall from last year where we use this type of generative modeling just to learn a density, um, a, a conditional density function, a likelihood function that we can then use for doing Bayesian inference when all we have access to is a simulator, so on, only sample from points. Uh, and you can also use these things um, to be components within larger Bayesian neural net, uh, Bayesian uh, model. And so here I'll just show you and emphasize this plot that Benjamin tried to show this morning and I couldn't uh, show you. Uh, it's samples from the full Bayesian posterior of this mass mapping problem where we've used um, a, a deep generative model to learn a prior from an implicit distribution which comes from samples from an actual uh, physical simulation. So that's my answer to the problem, generative modeling, uh, and always remain, remain within the bounds of a physical approach with Bayesian inference. All right. Thank you very much, Francois. Now we've got Anastasia Charantonis, who's going to uh, describe his thoughts and opinions on his favorite uh, flavor of machine learning for astronomy. OK, so hello, everyone. Uh, I will spend a tiny amount of time introducing myself because most of you, most of the other talkers here are known of the community. I'm outside of the community. Uh, I'm working on uh, uh, the community of uh, Earth observation, climate sciences, oceanography, etc. And I'm in the intersection of machine learning, deep learning for, uh, climate, uh, for climate sciences. So while you are more extroverted and you're looking towards the stars with the satellites, we are more introverted and we are looking at the surface of uh, the planet. But uh, don't think that we also are able to observe everything like, uh, like uh, we, we also have quantities that we, we cannot observe. So very often we have satellites and models, but uh, getting the actual values uh, will require some uh, very costly, uh, well, modestly costly compared to, to satellites, but uh, uh, costly observations to go and find, for example, the distribution of temperature inside the oceans, of salinity, of different things like that. And it has a lot of... I find that the, the two communities have some problems that, uh, that overlap, but there are other parts that are clearly uh, a problem of uh, astronomy and astrophysics in which I don't pretend to have any, so, uh, any solution. Uh, but uh, what interests me uh, a lot in uh, this community is that I, I started uh, reading some papers like uh, five years ago, just by accident, by spending time with astrophysicists and uh, astronomers, and showing, they were showing me papers on neural network. And the quality of, of the papers of the, the last few years and today has significantly grown. So uh, there are three three big, big families, let's say two big families and one uh, bastard family in between of, of uh, types of learning. So for the flavors for um, which we could consider, one big part of it would be non-supervised learning. So that, that this part can both be used for, uh, mostly used to explore the data, doing clustering, creating groups that have uh, common uh, approaches and uh, able to do uh, things that we can use to reduce the dimension of uh, our uh, huge data sets and create some la label uh, some labels and interpret what is happening before going further so generally non-supervised learning for me is something that can be useful when you're observing areas that haven't been observed before things like that to get a first understanding of what is happening and it can also be useful if you want to do uh, to target specific uh, 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 subclusters that some areas of your models 
that are not working uh, correctly, you can identify them and try to see if there is another model that could work better over that data. The other part of uh, the, 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 the in-between path is the semi-supervised learning, which is something that I think is very, can be very useful for the community because you, you very often have data sets uh, that uh, uh, you have to painstakingly uh, label yourselves and you, uh, from what I had understood, and sometimes it can be that when you have a, a, a very large data set that you want to label, approaches such as semi-supervised learning can be very, very useful to fill up your data set. And I think that is one of the approaches that could uh, be useful in the community. And finally, supervised learning, which we saw a lot of today. Let's first address the, the, big, the big two parts. For me, the obvious are the CNNs and company. Uh, so what, uh, uh, YOLO that we saw today, uh, ResNets, etc. All, all those that are trying to um, uh, use uh, uh, spatial correlations that exist in the data set and uh, extract feature, uh, feature maps to identify important information present in the images. And similarly, time series analysis especially when you are trying to see, for example, uh, identify if, uh, if there's an object uh, uh, around another planet or things like that, you have long time series. So these are the, the two big families. I find that often, they are, they, like most models, will, it will require, uh, um, as you said, it cannot be applied directly out of the box. Uh, unless you have a very, very good label data set, uh, using those approaches and all the others, it's not totally obvious to, to do. And very often here comes the role of, uh, of the astrophysicists, of the physicists, the interaction between the machine learners that actually know the, uh, the models and people who know the problems. So uh, a big part of that for me is uh, doing feature extractions and preprocessing. And for those, I had uh, I cited some things like uh, perhaps sometimes you might want to do PCA or random forest to extra to do a bit of variable selection uh, uh, or uh, dimensionality reduction, uh, transforming your uh, smartly transforming your qual uh, qualitative cyclic and other variables and normalizing your variables correctly are important, but. Most importantly, I think it's very important to know at what point in your architecture you have to inject what information. Because otherwise you might end up uh, having, for example, trying to put a whole image uh, and two or three random informations at the, at the very beginning of the network. And the information, the, the two or three other qualitative information get lost uh, if you put it at the very beginning. So understanding at what point uh, of your architecture to include and when to inject what information is something very important, I believe. Then there is the choice of the metric. As was said before, when you do uh, an RMSE, you are doing an underlying uh, hypothesis that uh, uh, you are learning something very specific. But you could also, at the same time, not only uh, estimate the mean of your distribution, but also the standard, devi uh, the standard deviation. Uh, there are many different uh, approaches to building your cost function in a way that will minimize and give you outputs that are more, perhaps more interesting, especially this part of estimating, sorry, uh, I don't know to what sort, well, let it be. The, the part of estimating mean and the standard deviation, I think is something that can be very, very useful in the field to as uh, ascertain the to to estimate the uncertainty of your predictions, and finally, yeah, uh, fin uh, uh, finally the for the choice of the metric there is adversarial learning. So uh, uh, similarly to generative adversarial networks, training another network to identify if your output is the correct output or if. Uh, uh, or, or if and, uh, uh, the target was the real output, it is something that can really help because you, you somehow outsource the learning of the correct metric to another part of the neural network. And that can be very, very usef uh, useful for image uh, analysis. 
finally, for people that are starting into the field and, and want to do that, and even for experts, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, automatized machine learning approaches that have some good instincts built into them on how to normalize, how to correct, how to split your data set, make sure, uh, make sure that your data set doesn't have too much data leakage and things like that. So even though I know, well, I usually have my idea of what uh, that uh, architecture I would like to build. Uh, nowadays, before building an, an architecture, I go through AutoCares to make sure that uh, there isn't one, uh, to, to build a baseline. That I and very often, it's, uh, the architecture it suggests is quite close to things that would actually work well. And finally, a big thing that I didn't see talked about is the hyperparameter optimization. Machine learning and deep learning have so many hyperparameters, so many of them. And uh, I will just borrow kombucha girl for one moment. Doing grid search and random search is just a waste of time. And you, we should take a bit of time to familiarize ourselves with Bayesian optimization techniques. There are libraries that do that and can save also the planet a lot of uh, uh, wasting energy running uh, trainings for no good reason. Okay, so those were my thoughts on things that might interest you, and we can uh, discuss them in more detail later. Thank you. Thank you very much. So finally, we're going to move on to Lawrence, who is uh, here virtually. If you can share your screen, however that happens. Yes, one second. All right, do you see my screen? Yes, but it's not full screen yet. It's not full screen. This. Um, all right, just one second. Mm. There okay, we go. Is that good now? Yeah, that's working now. Yeah. So um, I'll start timing you, and you've got 10 minutes, but I'll give you a violent cough, a COVID-like cough, <laughs> to, uh, when, you've got, <laughs> right, when you've got three minutes left. <laughs> thank you. Uh, OK, good. It's not going to be super long. Uh, I just uh, wanted to start by uh, saying that it's a pleasure to be here, and I would have really liked to come in person, but uh, it turned out not to be possible. But I'm still super thankful thankful to, to the organizers for making it possible to uh, to participate remotely. Um, OK, so uh, what I'm going to say is sort of a little bit uh, in line with a lot of the things that have been said so far. Uh, so I'm going to be talking mostly about supervised learning because that's the subject that I have the most experience with. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the perspective of a cosmologist uh, on, on supervised learning and applied to cosmology. Um, so uh, those uh, machine learning methods have seen a lot of expansion in the last two, three, uh, you know, four, five years even. And, and that's despite, you know, having initially faced a lot of criticism and, and skepticism uh, by the community because of the fact that they're sort of a black box. Um, so at this point, uh, despite all of that, I really think that uh, machine learning methods are here to stay. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, there is the speed of analysis. Uh, so just to give an example from my research, um, you know, as, as we all know here uh, with LSST and Euclid at W1st in the coming decade, there's, gonna be, there's going to be an unprecedented amount of data that's going to be coming. And uh, analyzing that data is going to be a serious challenge for traditional methods. So uh, for example, uh, just to give an example from my research, we're expecting to discover 170,000 new strong additional lenses and uh, basically to uh, analyze all those lenses uh, it would take 1,400 years of a person's time uh, to do even the simplest uh, lens modeling of, a uh, of all those lenses. So uh, with deep learning, uh, it's actually 10 million times faster. And so it would take about just half an hour on a single GPU. So a problem that is completely untractable becomes extremely easy using machine learning because of the speed up that you get in your analysis. So that's the first reason why I think machine learning methods are going to be here to stay. Uh, with the uh, the volumes of data we're expecting in the coming decade. 
But another reason why I think uh, uh, deep learning is here to stay, and that in my opinion is even more interesting, is that uh, you can get even better accuracy in your results. So basically what that means is that we can do better with machine learning than what we could do uh, with our, even our best traditional methods. So, and, and the reason why this is the case falls into a number of different classes of problems. Uh, but just to give a specific example, uh, in the case of uh, under constraint inverse problems, uh, it allows you to learn complex priors implicitly from your training data. So that's something that uh, Francois uh, gave an example of. So just uh, another example of that uh, from my research. Um, so uh, in strong lensing, we want to reconstruct the undistorted images of background sources. So uh, on the left column, that image, so we want to go from the top to uh, the bottom uh, to reconstruct the background galaxy. And uh, uh, with machine learning, it turns out that we can do better than uh, with our best uh, traditional uh, linear inversion methods. And the reason for that is that uh, with traditional methods, in order to keep the problem tractable, we're constrained to use very simplistic Gaussian priors, which basically end up biasing our reconstruction. And with machine learning, it allows us to do better because we can learn a much more complex prior from the training data that's much more representative of what an image of a galaxy actually looks like. Um, and there's a lot of other examples of that. So there's uh, uh, other reasons, but I think like for me, from my point of view, these are the main two reasons uh, why I think machine learnings are, are here to stay. Um, so uh, this is another take of, on, on the same plot that we saw uh, uh, earlier, but uh, uh, machine learning has definitely become extremely popular in the recent years. Uh, so that's a plot showing the number of papers with uh, machine learning in the abstract as a function of the years. So clearly in the recent years, it's been really, really accelerating. So um, so clearly it's become uh, extremely fashionable to use machine learning, but uh, the question is, is machine learning always better? So she basically always use, using machine learning on your problems. And I think like a lot of the other panelists have said, um, uh, uh, maybe not. So uh, we know that, uh, you know, deep learning methods like CNNs and RNNs, they're universal function approximators. So that means that they can basically approximate any function to arbitrary uh, accuracy in theory. So there's basically, they're just fitting functions. So um, training a neural network on a problem just for the sake of showing that it can be done is not necessarily uh, really interesting because we already know that you can do that. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you know, if you're choosing to use a fitting function, uh, there's always some risk involved of having not a good fit and, and exactly quantifying how good of a fit you have. And, and we also lose track of the underlying physical model when we do that. So uh, because there's this loss, there should always be some, some, some important gain that justifies this loss. So uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, that could be speed, that could be gain in accuracy compared to what you can do uh, with your otherwise your better method. There could, be, there could be other reasons, but there should really be a reason you could really be thinking is 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 there really a gain that I get by using machine learning that would not I would not be able to get uh, otherwise. So uh, to answer the question of the debate, uh, so what methods are most appropriate uh, for using astronomy? Um, from the point of view of supervised learning, uh, if we're going to use machine learning to do science, uh, it's going to require having very good understanding of the uncertainties of the predictions we get with uh, machine learning models. So. Um, for me, the most appropriate methods in my opinion are going to be the ones that allow uh, well calibrated uh, uncertainty estimates uh, of their outputs. So um, there's going to be uh, there's going to, to need to be real investment from the community to really define what uncertainties we want to see from machine learning methods. And, and, and the answer to this question might be a, a problem dependent answer, meaning that uh, for some problems, uh, we might it might be okay to get less accurate uncertainties because uh, they could be sufficient. And for other problems, uh, maybe we're probably going to definitely want to have the best uncertainties we can with some guarantees about their calibration. So just to give two uh, quick examples uh, of uh, methods uh, that allow you to quantify your uncertainties, there's, uh, you know, uh, that have already been mentioned, there's Bayesian neural networks and also approximate Bayesian neural networks, which are usually uh, done using variational inference. Um, there's, uh, so with those, I'm not going to go into the details. We can talk about this probably uh, in, in the debate. Uh, I'll put an example here from uh, uh, strong initial lensing modeling, where it works very well. Cough, cough, but, you've got uh, three minutes. Examples where it does, okay. <laughs> it doesn't really work uh, well. And, and, and another example uh, of, of a machine learning based method that allows you to, uh, 
to um, get uh, uncertainty quantifications is, is uh, likelihood free inference. Uh, or I think it's become more popular to call this uh, simulation based inference. So I'm going to stop here and, and uh, so that we can have some interesting discussion time. Can I just turn this? Right. Thank you. Wonderful for all the uh, participants. <laughs>
so so yeah for, for for me deep learning is is a subsection of uh, machine learning a very specialized subsection that has enormous potential it has amazing applications but there are a lot of applications where uh, the gains the uh, the, uh, obviously, for images, convolutional neural networks are amazing. Uh, they are able to identify features, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And but sometimes, but sometimes after that, uh, you can graft another uh, simpler ma machine learning algorithm on top of it. If, for example, you can use an autoencoder, uh, a convolutional autoencoder, to reduce the dimension and to get to the pertinent information. And then if, if you have a different task, you don't have to always uh, just use deep learning. Depending on the task, there are a lot of very well established algorithms uh, of, um, of machine learning that perform very, very close to, to deep learning for some tasks when you don't have enough data also. Because one of the issues sometimes is that you don't have that many data to train a, a model with that many parameters. Even though today we saw a very interesting talk with training only on one image, but it's on a specific type of problem. In other fields, when you have 30 images, uh, you, cannot, you cannot train a very deep uh, neural network on that. Yes, Guillaume, you have a, a comment or, and or a question? Yeah, no, it's, it's about uh, Anastas' last comments here. Yeah. Actually, there is a recent paper called Deep Priors, where you don't do any training on a single image and you can do extrapolations. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have seen, but it's uh, for a very specific application. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I mean, if you, if you were trying to... Uh, on, on, uh, uh, it depends alway, always on the problem. One of the two of you, if yes. you know enough, or should game. Or I, I, I can one. try. Yeah. Okay, because so for people out of the so this is something we we actually didn't mention in any of our talks is the concept of um, oh, and I forgot the name right now. Um, inductive, bias. inductive biases. Yes, uh, that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to say. So, you know, for any particular type of data, the fact that CNNs, for instance, work very well on images is because they are not completely randomly constructed. They are based on this idea that to analyze an, an image with uh, transactional invariance and stuff like that, um, you need some convolutions. And then you also expect that the image has some structure at, at multiple scales and multiple levels. And that's, that's exactly what a convolutional neural network does. So in, in a deep prior approach, the idea is that uh, you look at um, how such an architecture, a CNN, responds to some type of data, and then you just use the fact that the, the CNN is meant to work well on, on you know, natural images as a prior for the task that you're trying to do. So it doesn't actually need to be trained specifically for anything, but just the structure, the inductive bias that comes from the structure of the architecture uh, is adapted to natural images and you can use that for solving your inverse problem. And so you can use it for uh, increasing the resolution of your image uh, and this type of things. And uh, typically uh, with this type of approach, artifacts will be rejected by, by the model because they don't actually conform to the, the architecture that's being used. So that's the idea of deep priors. And do you have any comments on that, given that in, say, climate science, maybe there are natural images, given that those natural images quite often come from, from Earth-like pictures, maybe not uh, in, uh, as accurate as, uh, as, say, a Google image of some grass and a tree, or cats and dogs, but they're natural images in the same way that astronomical Im images have some aspect which have a physical property about them. Um, so I didn't fully get the, the beginning of the question. Uh, could you just repeat the very uh, beginning? Yes, so, so the fact that deep priors exists as a way to build a, some form of architecture which is sensitive to the data, does that influence the types of architectures which are used within, uh, yeah. within y yes. the climate science? Yes, but it uh, depends again a lot on... Uh, it's a very, very vast field and it can go for, for from estimating uh, based on satellite images or trying to 
emulate uh, numerical models with lower resolution or going for high resolution or trying to infer what is happening on the vertical column of the atmosphere or of the ocean. Uh, and mostly uh, uh, we are interested in predicting the, the evolution. Uh, uh, so all those things have inherent structures in them that indeed uh, 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 bias us towards specific architectures, but uh, differently from astrophysics, uh, the the rate of change of the cli uh, climatic. Uh, the so you you make an assumption that we are uh, when you are training, you are making an assumption that uh, was very well shown on the slide, Francois, that you are in a specific part of the distribution and your data is representative of that, and that's it. And for climate change, uh, due to climate change, well, uh, a lot of uh, the model, we have a lot of issues uh, validating that our training data, se the, the model that we will have will be representative of a, a future climate. So uh, I think that in, in astronomy, the, the fact that, that uh, there are specific structures uh, that you can observe all throughout the galaxy and they don't keep changing over time, uh, uh, well, yeah, but you you can still observe them. I don't. I I, I mean, uh, your, your your the v window you're observing with the light that is coming here is much much larger, and you can uh, sample much better the, the different uh, processes. While we are in a, a di very different uh, problematic, in that sense. Yes, so I'm just coming to that. I've noticed that we've got plenty of questions on the Slack and people in the room. Please put your hands up. But I'll start with a question from the Slack. From so Paco says, Mark. Whoop. Oh, okay. Uh, no, Emma, I would you like to do this? So I have the question of the Slack. So firstly, there is uh, Francisco Antonio Villahuesca Navarro um, saying that Mark raised a very important point. And what we ta what will it take for us to use deep learning and be confident that we have ruled, ruled out of Lambda CDM if that is out bec outcome of it? And I personally won't trust a black box to do this, even if trained on the best simulation ever. What kind of validation test do we need to make to convince ourselves of the robustness and reliability of this? Okay, okay so that was addressed to you, yeah. Mark, or at least uh, addressed to your slides. Right. So did you, did you catch the question? Yeah, more yep. or less. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I understood everything, but the reason, um, so I think is, um, the question is, uh, what test we do we need to do to uh, trust a machine learning algorithm telling us that we can you know, validate or rule out a Lambda CDM? And the specific reason I didn't put any example or anything in my slide is I don't know the answer. Uh, and, but I think um, probably, you know, I don't, I, I think the, the main, the, I would say that we never trust, we'll trust a fully black box. It's impossible, you know? And, and so this means that in order to use machine learning at some, we can to, to validate or rule out a, a model like that, I think um, uh, we should use it in a surgery mode, as Francois has been saying, right? I'm not saying it won't be used, but it probably will be used in some aspects of the pipeline in which to, to, specify, to, to model things that you cannot model. Uh, I don't think, you know, uh, the, the approach of, you know, throwing out all the data, best simulations ever, and uh, outputting a omega lambda value uh, is something that uh, will happen, or at least in the short term. Uh, but, you know, uh, but using it uh, in some specific ways, uh, yes. Uh, now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not being very precise, but you know, these are just uh, thoughts. <laughs> now, does anyone disagree with that, or is everyone so oh, does anyone come? I, I agree, and I, I, it's going to be a problem. It's already kind of a problem. It's going to be a problem very, very soon, because you can already write down a neural network. You apply it on DES mass map, for instance, and it will spit out some cosmological parameters. The thing is, we have no experience with doing this type of analysis as of this time. Whereas we've been building up you know, our experience and knowledge about how to do a two-point function analysis for like decades now. And so that's, that's really the thing. But apart from that, when we, we build our understanding of the approach well enough so that we can have some tests to make sure that everything works, I think it's going to be fine. People will, will agree with it. And where you need to pay more attention is, is, for instance, in the simulation that you use, 
um, to, to build your likelihood free inference approach. It's the same thing as for any kind of other cosmological inference, I would say. You need to make sure that your physical model is well understood and then you need to make sure that you don't have any sensitivity in your summary statistic that you extract with a neural network um, of, of things that you wouldn't have modeled correctly. And so Ben, for instance, mentioned this morning that you can robustify some of those summary statistics. So at the end of the day, uh, someone will, you know, claim that Lambda CDM is not true, maybe, we hope, I hope. Um, <laughs> nobody will believe them. Then we'll do a two-point function analysis. It will be, you know, borderline, and then we'll wait for the next generation experiment until we can do the two-point function analysis with enough data to verify what so you, know, you think the old original <laughs> machine learning is the, is people with more and more data is yes. going to be the way so it's going to take gonna 10 do years this. before we we trust we build you know this knowledge of how they respond to various systematics and everything and how we make sure that the simulations are well understood so that we can really uh, trust these things it's going to take 10 years but if you get the if you get the first detection then you wait 10 years for people to make sure and that you get the Nobel prize when uh, <laughs> when you were the first one to make it Lawrence you had some opinions on this as well yeah, so you know, I, I like I, I completely agree that like at this point, uh, we're not a hundred percent sure of what it's going to take uh, to trust. You know, no, we're not going to trust the neural network just by itself out of the box if it says that lambda CDM is wrong. But uh, you know, I think we won't trust any other method uh, out of the box claiming that uh, lambda CDM is wrong. You know, like all of the other statistical methods that we're using, we have been fine tuning them for years and years. You know, decades and and, uh, you know, we have been uh, really testing for systematics, trying to model them, you know, with like using a lot of simulations, using a lot of, you know, a lot of grad students. And uh, we have, uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's really been taking, taking a lot of efforts invested into validating those methods and testing them and, and really understanding all the effects that could be biasing results or, you know, or all, the, or all the systematics effects that you have that there that like you're not accounting for. And so uh, I think it's gonna have to be the same thing with machine learning. Like it's not gonna be any different with machine learning being part of your pipeline that you used to, 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 to model your data. And also um, I don't think anybody's gonna trust uh, mach like a, a machine learning answer until there's multiple different ways uh, uh, to corroborate the same result and dependent ways that have been like put in place to really corroborate the same result. Uh, the, the, you know, just like Francois was saying. Um, from multiple data sets and also just different, you know, kinds of analysis methods uh, using machine learnings and without using machine learning. Um, it's, it's a little bit the reason why, you know, it, it's how people found out that there was a, 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 an error in the bicep two uh, initial results, right? They put out the, they put out the detection of, of primordial B modes and uh, people just didn't buy it out of the box, right? There was a lot of, uh, uh, a scrutiny that was put, you know, it was an extraordinary result and there was a lot of scrutiny that was put in the analysis pipeline and then eventually people found uh, a mistake and, and, and you know, people realized that it was, the, that, that signal just disappeared if you took uh, foregrounds properly into account. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to take the same kind of scrutiny, scrutiny from uh, machine learning methods uh, in order for us to, to really believe the results that come out of them. will be uh, applied to machine learning because it's such a buzzword at the moment. Sorry, can, can you hear And me? I didn't catch that. No, I didn't catch the beginning. It was like- Sorry, I, I, I was just asking if the same, do you think the same kind of scrutiny will be applied since uh, machine learning and deep learning is so popular at the moment and everyone's trying to push it and it's such a buzzword? I mean, I think as soon as you have a, an important discovery that comes out of machine learning, of course, people are going to go right away trying to 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 scrutinize that result, right? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that anybody uh, is going to just buy it out of the box and say, "Oh, that's it; that the results were done. We just move on to something else." Uh, uh, Emma, uh, we've got more questions. Uh, there is one remark following uh, the current debate. Uh, uh, from Carolina Cuesta, and she said that we don't need only need to rule uh, it out, but also inform future models on what are the missing pieces, for example, what scale or the environment densities. And it's the question is, it's not clear to me how we will even examine this with current machine learning methods. 
So, do you, did, 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 was everyone yeah, clear on that? I missed, the, I missed the hand. How do we what? How, how do you what? The question? Yeah, the, uh, what's the end of, of the question? Sorry. Uh, it is not clear to me how we would even examine this with current machine learning methods. Determine what? Oh. <laughs> Would you like to ask the question in person? <laughs> uh, Emma, could you just pass the microphone back? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? So I was just thinking in terms of, um, okay, we're really out, but now we, we want to know how to modify general relativity to make it work, right? So I don't even know how we will go about that with current methods. So do you want to know in what scale is it failing? Or environmental densities, or have some guidance on physics properties that you want to modify, right? So it's basically about interpretability, I guess. The question I have. So, Anastas, do you want to feel this question to start with, or so I just want to say that these these problems are very similar to to what we have in in our community, uh, uh, oceanographers and uh, atmospherists do not trust uh, inherently uh, the, mod uh, the, the machine learning models and you, you don't see how to go to a bigger, uh, a bigger thing and the, the more time goes, the more we are forced to validate a lot of intermediate uh, results and validate a lot of uh, scale invariances. So more and more in our models we have cost functions that uh, are split at different levels at different resolutions that are supposed to represent uh, different uh, properties of the parameters existing at that scale. And this validation seems to have, at least in, in our community, started to work its way into the convincing uh, the, the old guard that uh, what we are doing uh, has some merit. But, uh, and I think, again, uh, similarly, I don't I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist, so I don't know what the invariants are and what they are the, all the, 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 the functions that, uh, that have to be represented correctly, but I think if you want to, to convince, you have to take into account uh, both through the cost function and or without the cost function that you represent all the, all the things. And so you, you move from one scale to another progressively, and then you build one thing from end to end, and you hope that all the skills are represented correctly for these kind of problems. Those are my two you, was, is this a question over? Yeah. Yes. Well, no, I, I just, just maybe to comment on. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll just finish this bit of the discussion. Um, so I think, Francois, you've got something probably to add to this. Uh, but Mark, whilst you've got the microphone. <laughs> well, no, I, I just want, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's completely right. So it's a matter of uh, interpretability. And I think once, uh, I mean, for whatever met method you use, once you know, uh, you realize a given model doesn't work uh, or there are some tensions, you need to understand why and where the, these tensions come from. We are seeing this with uh, uh, H0 tension, for example. We don't know still if it's systematics or, or what's driving this, even if you are using you know, standard uh, methods to derive it. Uh, so I think this, of course, will be you know, uh, worse if you use a, machine, a deep learning network uh, you know, uh, as a black box because, you know, <laughs> Uh, understanding uh, what is the cause of this, is, is it systematics in the data, systematics in the network, and, uh, but again, this might come uh, as, you know, the, the field becomes more mature and we are uh, having, we have better techniques to uh, understand what's or dig into the network, uh, maybe, you know, there's ways of, of uh, finding this, but I think this fight is unavoidable at some point. Francois, do you want to just make any comments further? Yeah, no, I mean, all of this is true, but th this brings up uh, a very, very interesting point is the fact that uh, one of the most exciting things you can do with this type of machine learning models, for instance, simulation-based inference, uh, where it's just another approach for doing Bayesian inference, where you have a simulator. But so the problem that you have now is that the same problem for any type of Bayesian modeling, stop me, Ben, if, I, if I'm wrong, uh, but you are working within the confine of a model, right? So you're trying to fit or, or find the parameters of a model by comparing it to data. The problem with machine learning in high, with high dimensional level of data is that it's very difficult to see then if your, your simulations um, 
actually match the data, or should I say, if the data is an outlier compared to your simulation model. So you might be able to find a set of parameters that will be close enough to your, to your data point that you actually observe, but it doesn't tell you that this data point is necessarily rejected by the Bayesian model that you've assumed. So you have this problem of, of model misspecification, and finding out that you have an anomaly compared to the model that you've assumed, anomaly detection with machine learning is still not easy, very difficult to do. Um, and so we, you know, same thing as assuming lambda CDM for some, for analyzing data that wouldn't be. The additional problem is that when we use these neural networks to summarize the information, uh, we lose our ability to kind of like physically understand the output and so be able to recognize quickly that um, the data might mismatch the model. So it's becoming more difficult um, and anomaly detection is not solved. Um, so. Yes, I agree. So Guillaume, you had a question. Would you like to? Um, yeah, so the original question was what flavors what? <laughs> what flavors of machine learning uh, is adequate to, uh, to, uh, to astronomy? But uh, <laughs> uh, the um, and actually, so we, we talked a lot about deep uh, deep ML. Uh, well, of course, there are very old text like um, self-organizing maps for yeah. discoveries. So that maybe is adequate for imagery or for like quasars. So. And, uh, and there is also the, I mean, as Ben was mentioning, so Bayesian inference is part of machine learning in some way. So, and that's um, one thing that we could, I was, I was going to ask is maybe, okay, so we, we chatted a lot about deep ML for like a simulation or for uh, doing like inference, but maybe if you want to do discovery or if you want to actually assert your discovery with something, uh, what would be the flavors that would be uh, adequate? So maybe for Anastas, like in oceanography, uh, do you use, I mean, I've mentioned some, I mean, self-organizing maps, but do you have other tools that would be uh, relevant? So? Well, uh, uh, right now, uh, generally, I like doing uh, uh, dimensionality reduction initially. Uh, so uh, the, uh, that can also be u uh, that can also use uh, uh, deep learning to do dimensionality reduction initially. So you could see an, uh, an autoencoder that, uh, as a, as a form of uh, uh, non-supervised learning in some sense that you are trying to to find the the, the minimum compression of your data, and afterwards, uh, the, the analog methods, there are the, the a, lot of a lot of clustering methods that have moved a lot of last few years also. There are uh, clustering methods that are uh, getting uh, put inside uh, a deep learning pipeline, so you can have a convolutional neural network and in the middle of uh, uh, a, a convolutional autoencoder and in the middle in the same pipeline include the clustering uh, algorithms. But uh, ge generally, those are the, the approaches that you would do because you need to first find similarities in the, in the data and then study each cluster uh, with someone that understands what is uh, the physics and what is going on. But uh, those are the, the most common things that we are doing right now. And Mark, I think you've got something. Yeah, no, for, uh, to answer. So for data exploration, I think I, I will uh, like to advert. I mean, I'm particularly excited with uh, self-supervised learning, or uh, this is something that is moving quite uh, rapidly in the community. I think it's also uh, in the ML community I'm talking, and I think there's lots of potential there. Mark, so, would you mind just elaborating a little bit on what self-supervised yeah, so is? Yeah, so self-supervised learning is, um, well, it's a family of learning. Uh, I will basically uh, describe what is contrastive learning, and in which essentially the power of this is that uh, it's, all, it's the same idea. You try to learn some representation of your, your data. You try to reduce the dimensionality of your data to explore it. But the, the strength of this is that um, you, use, you, you, do, you do it by augmenting your data set essentially so basically you're taking some if you do it on images you're taking some images uh, you apply some uh, transformations to that image and uh, and and you're trying to uh, make um, images uh, make the network understand that these two images that have been transformed come from the same image and so they when the, you you obtain a representation of these of these objects they must fall a in, a in a nearby region, while objects that come from different images or, or different data points uh, should be apart. And, and so that's very powerful for our 
um, uh, discipline, I think, because all our data sets uh, contain lots of biases and, and, and instrumental effects. So you have uh, pixel sizes that might be a change or there are uh, you know, different effects that you have on your data. And by doing these augmentations, you can tune your augmentations to make your representations being agnostic to these uh, properties of your data that you don't want the, 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 the representations to be focused on. And, um, and I think you know, it's extremely powerful to, to visualize your data and eventually to find outliers as well. Um, and so, yeah. So for people who would be interested in looking more into this, do you have, for, for example, you have uh, clear ways using, say, Keras or tools which are good at doing supervised learning or unsupervised learning, do you have a good uh, way to get into self-supervised learning? Well, uh, it, it's, it's, still, it, you know, it's still neural networks, it's still TensorFlow, Keras, or, or PyTorch. There are a couple of, of frameworks that have been popular, uh, developed essentially by uh, Facebook and, and Google, as always. So uh, I think the, the, the name for the Facebook one, I think, is seem clear. Uh, no, it's Google one, and, uh, and, uh, and, the, fa and the Google uh, Facebook one, I don't remember. Uh, but I mean, there's, uh, it's, it's available online, so. Okay, great. Do we have more questions online? Uh, yes, there is one from Jenny Wagner, and she's asking, do you think deep learning is so attractive because we are solving one problem, for example, gal galaxy classification? Uh, Emma, could you try talking more directly yes. into yes. it? Yes, like this? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe okay. take the mask off, that's okay. So, uh, Jenny Wagner asks, do you think deep learning is so attractive because we are solving one problem, for example, galaxy classification? It may be easy to generalize to solve others, for example, separate galaxies from star, and uh, for which examples are humans quicker in finding a solution, a solution instead of setting a full machine learning architecture, training data to solve the problem? Yeah, so I think I'll pass that over to Laurence. Did you, did you hear that well enough? I didn't quite did, did get the whole thing. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry. I don't, I can either try and summarize or you might be able to read it easiest on yeah, the Slack. Yeah, I'll, I'll open the Slack channel and I'm just going to need a second. Maybe somebody <laughs> that, else wants to go first. That might just be a little bit easier for you to comprehend, but yeah, um, I'll, uh, I think this might play into your, what your interests are a bit more. Just one second. I'm looking for the... It's so it's if you if you go to are they in Monday? Yeah, Monday. Then right at the bottom, we've got Emma's thread on this debate, and then it's the second to last question, I think. All right. Oh. I'll just so whilst you're just having a quick look for that, Harani's got a question, and do I have a microphone? I do have a microphone. It's here. Uh, <laughs> it's now turned on. <laughs> So uh, this is motivated by Mark's question, uh, sorry, comment saying that there hasn't been a real breakthrough enabled by machine learning in astrophysics. I'm curious for each panelist, what they think is the biggest advance made by astrophysics so far in your area and, and why? So this is an interesting question um, because I think it's not necessarily, it might not be a result a result it, or it might be the way that things have opened up so I think I'll start with Francois answering this question because I was hoping to get more time to think okay <laughs> I can give you more time to think um, so the biggest advance related to machine learning even though not not mind-blowing so I mean as I think Mark said um, everything that has to do with very low level pixel level reduction of the data uh, is a, a use case where you can greatly accelerate like orders of magnitude faster and more accurate than what could be done before. And in some cases, you don't actually care that much to be extremely accurate. So for instance, for detailing super rare events that you will then go up and do follow-ups on, it's the selection function may not be super important for the analysis that you want to do afterwards. And so that's, I think, is the perfect use case. So finding rare events for follow-ups uh, by going through a huge amount of data. Okay. Does anyone else have an opinion on that? I mean, if it's related to machine learning, I, I think I stick to classification, definitely, uh, which is, I mean, maybe the younger part of the audience will uh, forget about it, but before the deep learning revolution, it was a problem. We didn't know, uh, the, the, you know, the, the new surveys, uh, we were already talking about new surveys, and we didn't know how to classify all these uh, amounts of objects. We didn't even know how to separate stars from galaxies efficiently. We didn't, uh, uh, strong lenses was really a problem. How do we are going to deal with all these objects? 
and uh, and this has been you know absorbed by deep learning and nobody questions it anymore so it's clearly you know the approach to go nobody will tell you no now you need to look at these images uh, and, and I remember these discussions we had uh, when, you know, at the time, it was the time of the Galaxy Zoo, for example, for galaxy morphology. And people of the Galaxy Zoo were, I mean, the only approach we have come with that was, you know, accurate enough was asking people to classify galaxies. But we had a problem when Euclid uh, was uh, announced, or, I mean, we, we already knew that it will take uh, several hundred years to have Euclid galaxies classified with a, uh, with a Galaxy Zoo approach. And it was a problem, and it's not a problem anymore. So I think this is, you know, a key advancement. I, I'm not one to, you know, uh, remove uh, power to the, or, or uh, you know, uh, to this to this technique. I think it's a key advancement. Now I think we want more, and and this is because we see there's also potential. We want more, and this is the question whether where and uh, at which we uh, where we will arrive, right? But for galaxy classification, I think it's a real it's a real. This process. runs really nicely into the question that Jenny asked, which was about um, for what. Um, for what tasks would humans still be quicker than setting up a whole deep learning pipeline and doing the analysis? Mm. Uh, which is the question that I sort of was directing at, at Laurence. Um, but, you know, Galaxy Zoo was able, you, with Galaxy Zoo, we could ask people to do this and, because it was faster than machine learning at the time. But, uh, yeah, if I carry on this question with, with you, Laurence, what do you think? So, uh, I mean, there's a, so clearly, you know, for classifying galaxy morphology, for finding lenses, even like the, the case that I mentioned at the beginning of, of my presentation, you know, modeling lenses, uh, there's a lot of, of problems where, uh, you know, you just, you know, you can try to do it the traditional way for a couple of examples and, you know, quickly you run, you just because of the sheer amount of data you have to analyze, you quickly realize that it's going to take you hundreds of years, even thousands of years to finish analysis of all the data you have. So clearly, um, you know, at, at, at this point, obviously you should try to find something quicker because it's just, I mean, you just don't have a thousand years to analyze all of the LSST data. I mean, even if, if it takes a thousand years, even if you hire a hundred grad students, it's going to take you like a hundred years to finish. So um, clearly like you need new analysis methods. Uh, there is some problems where, you know, the analysis is very tedious and difficult, but then you only have one data set to analyze. Uh, you know, for example, um, you know, uh, I'm thinking about the the um, the uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, but uh, uh, so imaging black holes, for example, uh, it's it's something where you're not hoping to uh, image a lot of these black holes. There's going to be very few of them, and so you have to be very careful to think about where is the application of deep learning where you will have some gain. Because if you just think about, okay, I'm gonna to have to do a lot of those simulations to train, to, to build a, a training set, to train one of those methods, and, and it might end up, and then I'm gonna have one data set to analyze, then the overhead might be way too much compared to the actual gain that you get. So you really have to think carefully about, uh, is, is it really, is the spin gain that you get, you know, when you compound the generation of your training data, or and and or you know, gathering your training data and labeling it, uh, is there going to be a significant amount of gain compared to just doing the analysis the, the standard way? If if you try to do the standard way of analysis and there's just no way you can do it, uh, then you know it might be worth it, even if you have a single example that you're trying to analyze, it might be worth it because uh, the gain will be in the accuracy in that case, rather than the speed. Uh, so for me, uh, I think that these are sort of uh, the main two places where I think you can have a significant advantage of using machine learning. It might be worth to have like all those overheads and, uh, you know, uh, compared to using humans to find the solution. And Anastas, do you so in your field, do you find that there are problems where humans still have an edge over over ML methods, or obviously uh, if you, find, if, if you define Bayesian, if you if, if you define you know Bayesian inference as a machine learning myth, as, as machine learning, then no. Uh, but uh, I think <laughs> but, some of us do here. So. <laughs> but, uh, uh, in in oceanography and in the big models. Yeah, uh, parameterization of the big models is an unsolved problem that we are trying to do with uh, deep learning and uh, optimization, etc. But there are so many unconstrained uh, parameters for what is uh, 
the, what we call the global circulation models mm -hmm. that uh, we, we haven't found the solution with deep learning and we still have to go manually change parameters and try to uh, understand what the hell is changing on the global circulation <laughs> when I add, uh, I change the, the albedo slightly in the, in the North Pole uh, during uh, February or whatever, <laughs> and, and you go like, okay, this year we have to parameterize that specifically and see if on all the runs it, uh, it performs, uh, it, it gives a better El Nino or something. So that, uh, that is something that we still don't know how to do correctly with uh, deep learning. Or so really in the model building side of things. Yeah, on the model. The model yeah, yeah, if I can just add something, you know, uh, uh, you know, for, for an example where machine learning is still not there, you know, just thinking about things like um, stellar population modeling. Uh, it's a place where you have simulation to do that, but the simulations are just, you know that they are not good enough. They really, uh, they're just not a good representation of, of your data. And so you could try to use a machine. It's a very difficult problem. So, you know, it could have, you could think that that machine learning has a lot of potential there, uh, but you cannot use just an out of the box machine learning method because the best you will do is you will learn your simulations, which you know is not a good representation of your data. So these, this is a class of examples where, you know, you just don't have good enough simulations where um, this is a class of example where, you know, using machine learning is not, uh, is not the way to go, at least not out of the box, you know, machine learning is definitely not the way to go. Thanks. So we're in the last 10 minutes and I'm sure everyone in here is very eager to go to the cocktail. <laughs> so are there any more questions in, in the room at the moment? Yeah, so we've got one from Niall. Um, he's, have you got a microphone now? Oh. It's uh, Niall. Uh, so I, I wondered if the, uh, you could comment on your optimism for going beyond the situations where we can um, either have a model or our potential discoveries are perturbations to that model, is in the, the ability for machine learning to take a set of data and infer some physical model about the universe better than a human could do. Uh, Perhaps that's too far in the future, or not. So, Mark, would you like to have a go at that first? <laughs> uh, you can I, say no. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I can answer that. I, I definitely cannot <coughs> answer that question, and, and, and especially at this time. But um, so I think uh, in terms of, uh, if I understood your question, you know, if a machine learning framework can infer better a model, um, than humans, uh, I think that should be the case, right? Because you know, uh, we are, uh, as as has been shown uh, in in the talks here, we are still using, uh, for example, for cosmology, very simple statistics, right? And we don't know that. Uh, and uh, I think one of the power of, power of these uh, techniques is you are able to find uh, you're not limiting yourself to some uh, specific summary statistics, right? Uh, but I think your question goes beyond that, so I, I'm not really sure I, I understood it properly. I, I could say model discovery from unstructured uh, data. Yeah. So on this, I don't. Uh, I think it's very far in the future. Indeed. Yeah. So you mean not, not only you know uh, ruling out a model or validating a model, ruling out a model, but also finding the right model, which is related to the question that was. Uh, um, model development, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll move on to Francois now. I've given you a second to, to put your brain to work. Yeah, no, it's, yeah thanks. For, for <laughs> uh, so it's a very good question. And actually, I had an extra slide that I removed of things that uh, I don't think will happen. And so, for instance, that thing, model discovery, we have seen examples of like uh, symbolic regression um, on applying some problems. It gives you a formula, but at the end of the day, it doesn't learn anything, right? And so. I think it, maybe it's also something we actually do not want because we still want a human to be somewhere there. And where the human comes in is in the creativity and the uh, understanding of the model building. So maybe you could imagine far in the future some assisted you know, correlation finder thing that will tell you, oh, you should realize that this correlates to that other thing. But at the top of the thing, there will always be a human until Skynet. 
So <laughs> I, I'm very skeptical of any automated thing discover, discovery, and I don't actually want one because I want to keep a human at the center of everything. You still want to be paid at the end of yeah, the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think we'll, if, if is there any more questions. Uh, burning on the slack or shall we call this a day and, and head for, for we call it a day well I want to thank all of the participants who've uh, been excellent at giving us their opinions and their ideas and debating and discussing very nicely answering some of our questions and uh, yes so uh, let's give them a round of applause And now pass over to, to Henry and the organisers to let us know what's happening next. Okay, now it's the cocktail. Um, I think the, uh, the announcement from Karim is that basically we have to go in groups of two. <laughs> we're going to... Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go over to the observatory, but uh, probably best if we all stay together because you know there are animals out there in the uh, in the woods of the observatory cats and dogs or whatever yeah so yeah and to go back as well so you're not really supposed to go into the garden of the observatory by yourself did we stop the live stream i guess we did yeah and so thanks everybody it was really great i'm really happy how it turned, things turned out <laughs>